All right. Pigs must be flying. I've been watching all the Heisei-era Godzilla movies just because I like movies, and I haven't seen them in an extremely long time. Actually, when I was doing the math, it's actually almost eight years for most of these. Uh, and it's been an interesting experience, but none more than my viewing of Mechagodzilla 2 and Space Godzilla. My view before was Mechagodzilla 2 was a far superior film to Space Godzilla, and that Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla was literally the worst Godzilla movie in the franchise. I cited mainly major continuity mistakes based upon the events that took place in King Ghidorah. Now, I was wrong. Not only do I find Space Godzilla to be a much superior film to Mechagodzilla 2, but I find Mechagodzilla 2 to be, by far, the weakest of the Heisei series. Space Godzilla lays somewhere in the middle, uh, rotating back and forth with Mothra. Uh, I really like both of those movies. Uh, I think much of this came from my evolving taste in movies. While before I was a major you know, stickler for continuity, and yes, I was certainly much more snobbish then than I am now. Now I'm much more relaxed on things such as this, and I don't usually care as long as I'm entertained and feel the filmmakers did their job well. That by no means is saying Space Godzilla is stupid, it isn't. I actually found the plot to be extremely refreshing for what was becoming a stagnant series. Godzilla vs. Mothra was the largest moneymaker by far for Toho out of the Heisei series. So of course series head runner Shogo Tomoyama would want basically the same crew from that film to work on a sequel featuring yet another rebooted classic Godzilla moth monster. Shogo had given Takio Kawara a huge chance with Mothra and it paid off. If you want to know more about that scenario around that and so on and so forth, you can listen to the previous episodes of the Godzilla Vlogs. Okawara had a difficult relationship with special effects director Koichi Kawakita, and despite that having a minor effect on Mothra, it certainly had a large driving force as to why the visuals and execution of Mechagodzilla 2 are subpar at best. I mean, the script is pretty solid, the story elements themselves are great, and the music is one of Ifakube's best. So yeah, I, I really do blame what happened with Mechagodzilla 2 on the film's two directors. Mechagodzilla 2 is released, and it does okay. Nowhere near as good as Mothra. So Shogo wants to try revamping the Godzilla series with another up-and-coming director. In comes Kensho Yamashita, who, admittedly, I know very little about in terms of his personality, his filmography, his style, etc., 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 all I know is that he was a newcomer. He had a lot riding against him. He needed to try to revamp things, make this the 40th anniversary Godzilla film, while also racing uh, the original intended release date for the U.S. Godzilla. Yes, it was supposed to be being released in 1994. Though Space Godzilla still isn't really a, a milestone, and certainly doesn't live up to the 40th anniversary fame, the fact that it's good as it is, is a major testament to all the creators. But why did I come to really like this movie after so many years of spinning vile at it? There are several reasons why, and I really ache in it to what Kazuo Amari and Kawakita did in Biolante. There isn't just monster action here in Space Godzilla, there's gunplay, and, and our characters are in the thick of things throughout. In fact, that's one of my favorite aspects of the film. Despite it being clunky as to why they are all put in Mogera at the end, they are all fighting and have a purpose. Mickey ends up saving Yuki and her boyfriend. Gondo's sister convinces Yuki to forgive Godzilla and go after Space Godzilla, things like that. And I love the stuff on the island. It was a nice twist on ways to kill Godzilla. I also love the script's tightness here, being tense, serious, and then comedic precisely at the right moment. I laughed quite hard when our two main characters see Yuki crawling behind them, then he stops for a brief moment and they make awkward eye contact only for him to continue. To me, that was visually funny and visually refreshing. And like Biolanti, and unlike the other entries so far in the Heisei series, this portion of the film has many different things happening at once. There isn't just one mainstream story going on here. 
Yuki is trying to kill Godzilla while Operation T is trying to take control of him, and they are both playing against each other despite being on the same side. It was clever, and it was refreshing, especially for this series. I must also give the writers props for trying hard to incorporate continuity into the series as a whole. I mean, it makes no sense with what happens in King Ghidorah, but the characters were good enough that I didn't care as much, and I look at Ghidorah in the same light. Most people credit this mishmashing of continuities as bad writing. I wouldn't say that at all. Uh, the multiple writers of the Heisei movies it did many, many things right. The character of the monsters I will always praise to no end. They had many good ideas, and much of it, believe it or not, was actually well executed on screen. That also goes for Mechagodzilla 2, by the way, in terms of writing. I would, however, say it is lazy writing. Uh, they just didn't care about the details as long as the story was good and it entertained. Normally, I love this kind of writing, it, it being the main mentality of my favorite writer, Shinichi Sekizawa, who wrote most of the classic Godzilla films from the Showa era. But Heisei Godzilla isn't like Showa Godzilla, and the fact that Heisei Godzilla is a series. Each film leads directly into the next. Thus, continuity has to be one of those details to pay attention to. That being said, what the writers do in Space Godzilla, tying things in with Biollante, is actually pretty good. Unlike the last two films, which is Mothra and Mechagodzilla 2, this movie shows consequences of actions. Gondo is dead, which is why his sister joins G-Force. Yuki loses his best friend to Godzilla, which is why he's angry. A writing trait of uh, Hiroshi Kashiwabara. I think I'm pronouncing that right. But anyways, he also wrote Megagirus, and that's one of the, the traits in that. It also has the cosmos coming into Mickey, you know, telling her to protect the Earth from Space Godzilla, and this is because Mothra has to destroy the meteor since Godzilla killed Batra in that film. Uh, from Mechagodzilla comes Mogera, made from the scraps, or the scraps of scraps, if you really look at it in terms of continuity. Uh, Godzilla constantly shows up on the island to look after little Godzilla because of him adopting baby Godzilla from the previous film. These are all consequences from the previous films directly affecting the decisions and outcomes in this movie. And I do appreciate that. I do really like that. Even the cinematography is better than the previous two films, despite this guy also shooting Mothra. Don't watch the US Blu-ray release. I just want to say that right now. It's shit. Stick with the Japanese releases. But here are those intimate close-ups, both during key moments and, and character development, like Yuki giving Gondo's sister his lighter, or during the fight scenes in particular. Despite this battle still being too beam-spammy for my true liking, the monsters do actually make physical contact a few times here, which is way better than in Mechagodzilla 2, where the monsters only touched when one is immobilized. I'm not joking. There are interesting light choices here as well. There are great shots on the beaches, wonderful shots of Godzilla, who is shot way better in this movie than the previous one, that actually make him look huge instead of bland. The music is also great. I mean, it's not Ifukube, but Takeyuki Hattori's score is, I find, really good. Yes, even I like the pop song at the end of the film, and yes, I do think it fits well with Godzilla going back home to Little Godzilla. And yes, I find Little Godzilla cute, and yes, I still wish he looked more like Godzilla, but no, he's still cute. Hattori scored this movie like an Ifakube score when you really listen to it. You have a military march, you have brash music for the main villain, you have romantic music for Mickey and Little Godzilla. It's all like a, an Ifakube score without Ifakube being there to actually write the music. And apparently Ifakube turned this down because he didn't really like the script. Maybe that's the reason he gave, but I actually think it mainly has to do with Ifakube's old age and how little time he had to make the music for these movies. I mean, if you if you look at Destroya, the next film, he only had four days to compose that movie. That's insane! If you look at the recording sessions with Ifakube in the 90s, he's old. So old, in fact, that he doesn't conduct the orchestra. He has to let someone else do it, and he's always sitting there in the background. But of course, Godzilla is no stranger to other composers. Uh, the one I think of the most is Masaru Sato 
both Hattori and Sato before him uh, knew they were getting in a genre pretty much owned by Ifakube and had no problems with this. It's what drove their decision making. While Masaru Sato said, I decided to not do anything like Ifakube, Hattori said, I'm going to make something like Ifakube. That being said, Space Godzilla ain't all peaches and cream. As mentioned before, the continuity is a blaring problem here, and not one I can easily overlook. We still get too much beam spamming. Godzilla's connection with Little Godzilla isn't well developed like we see in the next film, though apparently a scene was shot with Godzilla trying to free Little Godzilla, which would explain why he's so hell-bent on getting Space Godzilla later, but the scene was cut for some reason, leaving us unsure as to Godzilla's true motives here. That is a genuine problem. Why is General Aso so adamant on Yuki piloting Mogera? He's been, Yuki's been on the island, not training to be a pilot. How does he know what to do? We, we see the other guys suited up and ready to go. Why not just launch them immediately instead of fiddle-farting around? Even though it does lead to the lighter scene, which I really liked, and it gives us an excuse to have our main characters in the thick of the battle instead of watching them from the sidelines. But that's still a problem. It's a logic leap. The, the head of Operation T has no reason to be so obsessed with his work, only that he's our token bad guy. Things like that. To me, that is weak writing. But still, I was quite surprised. I highly recommend watching Space Godzilla again if you get the chance. I certainly have a whole new outlook on the movie, and maybe you will too. Maybe not. Who cares, right? It's just a movie. So go on Facebook, like Ain Productions, follow our website, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. All the links are in the description below. In the end, this is Adam Nice of Ain Productions saying sayonara. Sayonara.